There are hidden places in Israel that you need to see. And here to talk about those places uh, in person, Aaron Lipkin, and to his left, Daniel Wright. Guys, it's a pleasure to have you here at Prophecy Watchers. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom. Let me just start out and, and say that most of you know Avi Lipkin. For years you've seen him uh, with us, and uh, this is his son. And it's great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Lipkin uh, is an expert uh, at Israeli geographical and historical places. And by the way, have, he has put together, uh, in conjunction with Daniel Wright, uh, three DVDs. Uh, and we're going to talk about the first two of them on this program, and then on a second program we'll be talking about the third. Uh, Daniel, you uh, are uh, our uh, artist in residence here at Prophecy Watchers. You design our magazine and do uh, layout work, but you're also uh, very much interested in the hidden places, the really important places in prophetic Israel, right? That's true. Uh, I really, um, it, I, I met Aaron back in 2012 uh, th through knowing his father. And um, what was really interesting after I got to know him personally, I realized, oh my goodness, he's a, he's a, he's a tour director. And so he specializes in sites and locations that are east of the Green Line. Um, obviously if you go with him you can see the entire country, but there are areas east of the Green Line in what, what the world calls the West Bank where the lion's share of Bible activity mm -hmm. in the Old and New Testament happened uh, in, this, in this heartland. And, and I just find it fascinating because it's just it validates the Bible. Uh, and a lot of Christians don't go to these places. Uh, that's true. And we had the pleasure in March of 2015 when we made a tour of hearing you lecture on a couple of places. Uh, one of them, Bethel, uh, just a little north of Jerusalem. And you lectured, uh, st stood there on a rather chilly morning, <laughs> but it warmed up uh, and, and lectured us on the historical importance of this place called Bethel. And it blew me away. And then, uh, of course, here on this DVD, uh, which is entitled The Gate of Heaven, uh, you have encapsulated all the truths about this geographical location. Most people simply don't make the connection in their minds between the Bible and ge geography in Israel. And it, that really helped me to do that. Uh, it, it almost, it, it just it almost goes beyond your imagination to think that the, the patriarchs of the Bible stood in those places and, and talked to God and made promises and, and uh, made covenants. Uh, it's a, it's, tell us about that mm. just a little bit. How did you begin to be interested in these things? Well, I've been in, in tourism for, for many years, um, and uh, especially educational tourism with, with young Jews that, that we would bring from the United States in order to strengthen their uh, Jewish identity, their connection to the Bible. And um, I haven't visited Judea and Samaria at all. We were always touring other parts of Israel. And uh, in the last five years, um, living in, in the Shomron, in Samaria, suddenly I found out uh, where I was living, and it was amazing. The Bible happened in Judea and Samaria. It happened in the biblical heartland of Israel. Mm. And all these amazing sites that we read about in, in the Bible, Hebron, Bethel, Shiloh, mm -hmm. um, you know, the story of the blessings and the curses between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ibal, uh, all of these stories happened in, in where I live, in my area. And you know, when I drive to Jerusalem from my house, you know, I, now knowing where these places were, I say, wait a second, this is where Jacob dreamt the dream of the ladder. This is where Elisha brought the bears from the forest. This is where uh, uh, Jonathan fought the Philistines. Mm. And this is just, you know, a half an hour drive from where I live yeah. to Jerusalem. It's just a, such a privilege to live in Israel. Well, mm. I'm, I'm going to read just a, a, a short passage from, from my Bible, and I want you to comment on it because... Uh, God spoke with Abram, Genesis uh, thirteen fourteen. 
The Lord said to Abram, after Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land that thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. So there is a spot in Israel where uh, Abram stood before he became Abraham, and God said, look in all directions from this spot, and I'm going to give you everything you see. Well, that's amazing. And we went to uh, Bethel, and then you showed us around this spot, and then to the north where there is a mountain. Tell us all about that. Where did Abraham stand? Well, for generations, when we read this, this uh, part in the Bible, it said that Abraham was in the area of Bethel. But there was no specific location mm-hmm. where exactly Abraham stood when God revealed himself to him and promised him the land. And the fascinating thing about living in Israel is that you have all the time archaeological discoveries that really strengthen the Bible and, and, and bring it in, show it in a different light. Mm-hmm. And you obviously heard of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls that were sure. found in the 1940s and 50s. And so one of the scrolls that was found there is a very interesting scroll. It's called the External Scroll of Genesis. And what it is, is it's basically the private diary of Abraham in the Hmm. Aramaic language. Hmm. And so if the Bible doesn't say exactly where Abraham stood uh, while receiving that prophecy from God of, of, of the promise of the land, when you go to the external scroll of Genesis, you read in Abraham's diary that Abraham says that God tells him to go to a certain place called Ramat Chatzor, which is the highest mountain right by where we stood. And, uh, and, and it says in the, in the diary that Abraham goes up to that mountain and he stands there and God says, you see all the land around you. This is the land that I'm going to give you. And when you stand there at Bethel and you see that mountain, you mm-hmm. see the physical place. You can mm-hmm. imagine, you can really literally imagine Abraham standing on that mountain and receiving that promise from God. For me, as, as, as a Jew living in Israel today, mm-hmm. is so, exci- so exciting. And I will never for, uh, forget that morning uh, when Aaron uh, went through a whole list of historical events that took place at this spot, Bethel, and uh, and I'll never forget looking to the north where this this um, it's a kind of a long east westerly uh, uh, situated mountain that what is three or four thousand feet above the terrain yes. probably, and of course we didn't go up there. Uh, tell us why we didn't go up there. Well, par- parts <laughs> of it are, are are military military areas that uh, that you cannot go. There's a big air force base on the top of it, yeah. uh, and, and parts of it are, uh, you need a special permission to get there if you want to visit. And I actually visited that place uh, two years ago, uh, and, and when I stood there I literally saw the whole land. Wow. Yeah. That's got to be amazing. It but is. I find it kind of interesting that the military has a, uh, a, a position located there where they can see north, south, east, and west. In other words, they can see everything. Yes, yes. It, I think it's a historical irony that 4,000 years after Abraham stood on that mountain and God showed him the whole land, yeah. that his descendants, 4,000 years later, decide to establish an army base that is looking over the land, just like Abraham, making sure that everything is good, that there's no you know, airplanes coming in mm. without any permission, just like Abraham. <laughs> now, Daniel was there with us. And what are some of your recollections of, of that day and that place? Bethel, the gate of heaven. Well, I, I do remember the temperature was, <laughs> was quite, quite low. Yeah. It's also interesting, and I didn't know this before that day, the, there's an oak tree, which also makes a, a brief showing in, in the video, um, that's there that's at least a thousand years old. And um, in the Turkish period, the Ottoman Turkish period, about 400 year segment of time, a lot of the trees in the country were, were, were denuded, they're were, they were cut down. Or, I think you could have been taxed if you had them on your private property. And so a lot of trees were gone, but these old trees have lasted from way before the Ottoman Turkish period. And, they're, and they always are preserved in these various places uh, across the country um, where they're considered to be sacred or holy places. So it's, it's kind of where, right where Aaron was giving his teaching. I mean, we were in the shadow of a thousand-year-old oak tree. In fact, it has a, a, a fence around it to protect it. Um, it's got a little bit of armature because it's, it's, it's quite old. Um, so I was just struck by, by how old it is and how the, the people 
even long before the founding of the nation of Israel. The people uh, felt it was important to, to preserve these sites and, and they used the trees to do that. Why is this uh, DVD named The Gate of Heaven? Bethel, uh, The Gate of Heaven. What, how did you arrive at that? Well, um, this, this site that Daniel just spoke about, um, it, it, it's a very special site because, it, first of all, it's, it's nowhere. It's, it's out of any village or, or ancient village around. It's a barren hill uh, that, that has a church. It has a, a mosque. Uh, it has a, a huge cemetery from 2,000 years ago. Hmm. Uh, and it, this place is a big mystery, it's a big puzzle. Uh, and the DVD uh, that, that, that you're talking about, The Gate of Heaven, speaks about uh, why people chose to be buried there. Why did Christians and, and Muslims build houses of prayer there, which is, again, nowhere? What is the importance of this place, this biblical importance? And in that DVD, I speak about the importance of the story of Jacob's dream of the ladder uh, uh, in, in the Bible and how that affected other stories in the Bible, in the book of Judges and in the book of Kings, um, why people chose Bethel always as a sacred place. And it all co goes back to Jacob's dream of the ladder. And you recall when Jacob mm -hmm. wakes up after the dream, he says, this is no other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Gate of heaven. Wow. So that's, that's the <coughs> that's, name that I chose. That's the title. <laughs> yeah. And you can actually go to that place. You can stand there. And you see a lot of different things. The tree that, that Daniel uh, described. Uh, I guess the reason all the trees were cut down, I heard at least, is because uh, the Ottoman Empire Im imposed a tree tax and if you cut down trees you wouldn't have to pay tax. Right? On, on private property. On private property. So uh, anti-tree. <laughs> but, but that tree survived in this place and that makes this place very interesting. There are, all, there are other little archaeological facets in, in this spot that, Correct. that you pointed out. Yes, yes. Talk about some of those. Well, there, like I mentioned, there is a church from the Crusader period mm -hmm. a, a adjacent to a mosque from the early Arab period. We're talking about times in history that are you know, a thousand years ago to uh, 1,500 years ago. Uh, but the really interesting thing is that there is a huge cemetery from the second temple period and from the first temple period. Mm. Uh, for some reason, Jews chose to be buried on that barren hill mm. aw away from, from Bethel, the ancient Bethel, because they believed that that place had an importance. It had, this, it had an important spiritual uh, um, status. And when you look today in Jerusalem, you have the Mount of Olives, which is the most ancient Jewish cemetery. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. why, are, why is it the dream of every Jew to be buried in the Mount of Olives? Because of the belief, the religious belief, in the resurrection, of, in the times of Messiah. Uh, and so people chose mm -hmm. to be buried in Bethel because, eventually, and that's what I talk about in the DVD, because of Jacob's dream, because of the, 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 the place where, where we see heaven touching earth, where we see a ladder yes. uh, that goes from, from earth to heaven with angels going up and down upon it. Uh, so this is a very, very important place. This is a very important story. And, you know, the Bible, the stories in the Bible happened 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. But it's also important to see how these stories affect us today. And we believe, just like God promised Jacob, you know, at the worst time of his life when he's running away from, from his brother who wants to kill him, um, when, he, when he is in, 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 the t in a terrible situation, God is, is saying to Jacob, I will, keep, I will guard you, I will be with you, and I, will, I promise to return you back to this land, to, to your homeland. And today, as, as a Jew, seeing the, the amazing miracle of Jews gathering from all over the world and coming back yes. to the land, uh, God kept his promise not only to Jacob, but also to his descendants. And I, 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 I'm so happy to, to be living in Israel. It's such yeah. a, a special time. And you're listening to Aaron Lipkin uh, of Lipkin Tours, uh, who... Uh, has made a special study of some of the, the amazing places in Israel you can visit. 
Uh, I, we've been talking about this particular DVD, Bethel, the, the uh, Gate of Heaven. Uh, a second DVD uh, has a, a little title up here called Finding Gilgal, The Footsteps of God. Mm -hmm. You also uh, took us to a place uh, called Argamon, I believe was the name of it. And uh, it's over toward uh, the River Jordan, uh, about halfway up uh, toward the Sea of Galilee, right? And if my geography doesn't fail me, but we were taken to a place, Gilgal. You see that word. I suppose all my life I've heard that word. I had no idea what it was or where it was or, or whether or not it could even be located. Tell us about this place uh, where we went. I think it's actually the, the most fascinating archaeological discoveries that was ever made in Israel that's connected to the Bible. Uh, as a kid learning in school in Jerusalem, I was told that the Bible is a fairy tale, mm. that the stories there never happened, that they're all made up. Wow. And, and the reason why I was taught that in school is because at that time, during the 1980s, there wasn't enough proof from the biblical heartland to prove the stories of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, people thought that the Israelites did not come from Egypt, that they were one of the Canaanites nations that adopted a monotheistic religion, believing in one God. Yeah. Uh, and that was because there was no proof of a large entrance of Israelites into the land as depicted in the Bible. And uh, Adam Zertal, Professor Adam Zertal, who spoke to the group, uh, a, a non-believing secular uh, yeah. archaeologist, uh, decides to make a survey in the land. Uh, now again, uh, under the impression that there was no, no Israelites, no Exodus, no Joshua, no Moses. And when he surveys the Jordan Valley, suddenly he finds so much proof of Israelite uh, presence. You know, it, it, I, I saw a PowerPoint presentation that they did and you see that before the time of the entrance, there was no settlement in, in the area of the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, you see hundreds of, of, of sites, of Israelite sites, springing out for, for no reason, which shows clearly there was a, an entrance in one point of, of an enormous amount of people into the land. And, and so this is one fascinating thing that, that well, we found. What amazed me uh, is that we went to, to a place where uh, there, there is a figure laid out on the ground that, what, is eight, nine hundred feet long, mm -hmm, something mm -hmm, like that, mm -hmm. in the shape of a foot with a, uh, a square laid out in the middle of right. it. A, a little sort of recessed square and the geography allows you to go up and look down at it, and you're seeing a footprint laid out. And this is what continues to boggle my mind about 3,500 years ago, mm -hmm. and it's still there. Right. How did it stay there for 3,500 years? The area was not populated, so, so people did not ruin it. It, it just le was left as it is. And Adam Zertal, finding you know, places of residence of, of Israelites, also, also finds these weird-looking structures that pr uh, were built by the Israelites, but he doesn't know for what reason. Mm -hmm. And these, these footprint structures, it's not just one or two, there are actually six footprint structures that were found by Professor Zertal, um, and, and, uh, and, and he says, wait a second, what, what did they serve? Why, why did the Israelites go into so much trouble building a, a, a footprint-shaped structure? And, and, and the interesting thing is that Adam Zertal is, is saying, okay, I'm not going to leave it that way. I need to look at the most important resource in order to understand what this is. And he goes into the Bible and he reads in the Bible looking for some sort of, of hint as to what these structures are. And uh, Zertal uh, uh, got to the conclusion that these are the ancient worshipping sites of the Israelites. Uh, and when we read in the Bible that Saul was crowned in the Gilgal, when we read that Joshua and the Israelites uh, circumcised in the Gilgal, uh, when, when, when whole offerings are being brought to Gilgal and, and sacrificed, Professor Zertal concluded that these footprint formations are the Gilgal that we read in the Bible. 
And today, when I stand in this footprint formation, I say, oh my God, this is where my forefathers stood uh, in the early stages before entering the land uh, into Bethel, into Shiloh. This is where they worshipped God. And the question is, why a footprint? Why? That, that's the big question, of course. Why, why would you go to the trouble to make a, a 900-foot-long uh, sandal print? Which is pretty well done, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that when, you, when you read the book of Joshua, mm-hmm. one of the most uh, repetitive sentences is, wherever your foot will, 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 wherever you will set your foot will be yours. And this footprint is the Israelites' way of saying, this is ours, mm-hmm. but it's also God's. It's God's footprints. And this is, this is why we gave that title. The title to, here of the DVD, and you can see this uh, yourself on the DVD, The Footsteps of God. You know, the Bible metaphorically says uh, that the, the earth is God's footstool. It's where he rests his foot. And I can really see... Uh, it's incredible. Yeah, what it's Daniel just does, incredible. It's moving, isn't it, it when you're really, there? It really is. <clears throat> what, what is so cool to me is the, the Gilgal, I always thought like you, I always thought it was a location, it's a town. Right. A town. But when you something. read the context, wherever the word Gilgal falls out as you run through the Old Testament and you find the different places, you can tell from the context that they're not coming to, coming. I'm sorry, coming from or going to the same place. They're not in the same location. So a Gilgal is not a town. It's a thing. It's it's not a place. It's 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 a it is a it's a camp. It's 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 a it's a place where they gathered, and they do these circumcisions. They do the, they do these festival events, and to go to the one the one that we went to at Argamon is is absolutely stunning. It's just it's it's beautiful. There's a there's a natural stone amphitheater that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Folks can get up on there and you can look down. It's, it's it's bigger than a soccer field. It's just and you can see it clearly. And I think now they're building a tower there, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Um, so that so that uh, visitors can actually uh, get elevated and see it as it, well. If you don't have a drone, you, it's, it's well, you would have to, to have a drone. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you have a drone. I do. <laughs> now, in, in Hebrew, what, what does Gilgal mean exactly, or what's it close to? Joshua, when when naming the place of circumcision, Gilgal, he says that it's to to, to take out the the badness or the the insult of of Egypt of the Egyptian. Uh, tradition, because mm. the Israelites were not circumcised. Uh, but w- when you look at the etymology, at, the, at the, the word itself, it basically says something round. And uh, in the DVD, I speak about the importance of this round, uh, this circular shape um, that also repeats itself when we say in Hebrew, when we say Chag, which is a holiday. Chag is the Hebrew word of circling. And circling is a very important thing in the Jewish tradition and also in mm-hmm. the temple. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there's a, the idea of uh, worshiping God in, 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 with your feet, if you will, by, by going in a circle. Well, that's what they did at Jericho, right? Yeah, they right. walked around Jericho and, and received the victory by orbiting, as it were. And, and, and in Israel today, when we refer to the feasts, we, we call a feast in Hebrew literally foot. Regel, and we don't know why, but now we understand. Ah, why would you call a feast a foot? That, <laughs> but but it, it's been the reason's been lost in history. But now you know. It's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> and these things are coming to light now. <clears throat> I, I think we are living in a very very uh, important uh, prophetic times. I think Israel's back in the land for a reason. Uh, that God has put Israel back in the land, and Amen. things are going to happen. Exciting things. Uh, now Aaron has produced a, a couple of DVDs which we've talked about. One is called The Gate of Heaven, uh, uh, the title Bethel. Uh, the other is called The Footsteps of God Concerning Gilgal. But today we're going to talk with a really ex- uh, about a really exciting uh, DVD called Shiloh. He pronounces it Shiloh. And Shiloh is a place in Israel that has very special significance. And one of the things that you do when you produce these DVDs and when you take tours is that you try to emphasize the connection between uh, Scripture and archaeology. Correct. And I think you've done a marvelous job of it. Thank you. Thank you. So let's let's talk about uh, Shiloh, the Forgotten Feast. 
what, what is Shiloh and what is this feast? Well, we know in the, from the Bible that Shiloh is the place where the tabernacle stood for most of the time of Joshua and the judges. Um, so we've been reading it in the Bible for, for you know, thousands of years for, for you know, everybody in their house and their church. But when you physically stand in the place, suddenly realities uh, come, come to life. Okay? So we know that the tabernacle stood in, in Shiloh. But where in Shiloh? Mm-hmm. And so you're looking for it. And in, in the DVD, we talk exactly about the, the location of where the tabernacle stood. Um, and, and, when, and when you read the other stories... Now, let, let me stop you right there. Yeah. Can you find, find where, exactly where it stood? And, well, and if so, mm-hmm. how? Because that's been a long, long time since it was there. So first we have to ask, why are we looking for it? Why are we looking for the place of the tabernacle? And I could say, I could speak for myself, if the Ark of the Covenant was in the tabernacle, and we know that it was, Mm -hmm. uh, that with the tablets of Moses, uh, if we know that Samuel uh, was sleeping adjacent to the tabernacle and heard God speaking, Mm. I want to come back to that place. That that is a place that defines my belief. It defines my identity, a place where where heaven touched earth, where God speaks to, to, to men. And, and so that, that is why we have that motivation. And so when we're looking at, at Shiloh, at ancient Shiloh, where, where that we know which is that we know that this place is ancient Shiloh, we immediately are, are running to, to, to search for this place. And again, where, where is it? I mean, we know that the tabernacle was a, a temporary structure. Mm-hmm. So how can you find archaeological evidence for a place? For a, for a structure that was temporary. Mm-hmm. It's not the temple. We don't have, you know, walls. We don't have... A, a pl- you know, and I'm, I'll stop you there again because that's causing me to think. Uh, I, we've all read about the tabernacle, which was, a, a, was designed to be folded up and moved and then and set up in another place. But I've never really thought about how do you prepare the ground uh, for the tabernacle before you set it up. Obviously you'd have to level it off or uh, dig something, and so maybe there would be traces. Like correct, that. correct. And you, you also have to take other things in account. We know that the, the tabernacle, we know that the temple were set uh, aligned east to west. The entrance to the tabernacle, the entrance to the temple is always facing east. Mm-hmm. So you really need to look for a place that can fit that direction. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons why we think we know where the tabernacle stood in Shiloh, uh, on a, a certain platform that is exactly aligned east to west. Uh, so you need to look for a place that is in the, the right directions. You n- need to look for a place that is in the, in the exact dimensions. Mm-hmm. And we know that the, the tabernacle and the courtyard had certain dimensions. And we speak about that in the DVD. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one of the conditions of defining the place where God spoke to Samuel, where, where the Ark of the Covenant was. Now the way you produce DVDs I think is very clever. Uh, you, you have a companion and the two of you are strolling around and having conversation about all these places. Uh, your companion uh, on uh, this particular DVD is a gentleman by the name of Zach Waller. Tell us about him. Okay. Um, Zach uh, is a very good friend of uh, the Lipkin family. Uh, he belongs to a m- Christian ministry called Hayovel. Uh, it says in Isaiah that uh, at the end of times, uh, the foreigners will be your vine dressers. Uh, and uh, Tommy Waller, who is Zach's uh, father, read this prophecy. And mm. when he came to Israel, he heard the plight of Israeli uh, vineyard owners uh, that they need people to help them harvest the grapes. So Tommy says, The Bible says I need to do it, and there is a need. I want to support Israel. Mm. You know, these things come together. So he established a ministry called Hayovel. Mm-hmm. And today Hayovel is the biggest volunteer project in Israel of Christians coming and helping Jewish farmers harvest grapes. Wow. And it's a great way to, to, to be part of the land, to be part of the redemptive uh, process of Geulah, of, of Messiah. Geulah. What's that word, Geulah? Geulah, redemption. Uh-huh. Redemption. Uh, the uh, the idea of uh, uh, re- redemption on a large scale, redeeming the whole land of Israel in a way, and preparing the way uh, for the kingdom. 
Now, back to uh, Shiloh, or as uh, Aaron puts it, Shiloh. Uh, this is an amazing place. Uh, uh, when we uh, toured Israel, March of 2015, uh, we were there at the time of, an, and Daniel remembers this well, we were there at the time of a solar eclipse. And you know everybody had read about the eclipse uh, in the weeks before we went, but we never thought we would be just entering the grounds of Shiloh at the time of this eclipse. And for some reason it made a big impression, didn't it? It did. It was, it was uh, taking the group down the slope. Um, at, at Sh- I call it Shiloh as well. At Shiloh when you're there there's a visitor's tower that you go into and they have a, a multimedia presentation that's really very well done. It is. Um, and tells uh, briefly the history. But then after we exited that building we're, we're descending the slope probably, I don't know, 100 yards at the most to this soccer field size rectangle that is aligned east to west like he's describing. And right when we got down there we were talking about the, the biblical references and that this very well could be the, the actual site where the tabernacle stood, where Samuel heard the voice of God. And at that, at that point uh, it was cloudy but there was a, a partial solar eclipse going on and everyone was, <laughs> everyone was enamored. You know, we were able to arrange to have a, a solar eclipse a solar in our eclipse. tour, you know. Yeah. Uh, so actually, it's the other way around. It was. We re- we arranged solar eclipses to all our tours. <laughs> yes. <so. laughs> yes. There's. It, it's Very it's good. a challenge, but for some reason, Aaron's <laughs> able to pull it off each time. I have, I have connections. Yes, you do. Now, well, <laughs> that's good. You, you're connected with Abby. <laughs> <laughs> with the father. Exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> the forgotten feast. Uh, Shiloh is the place where uh, we have the story of the mir- miraculous birth of a prophet. Samuel the prophet was born to a woman who, uh, who could not have children. And uh, so this whole thing sort of sets the stage for this. Tell us about that. Well, first of all, I think that, that the interesting thing that comes out of Shiloh, one of the, the most important things is the power of prayer. Uh, and and we, we hear that, that Hannah, uh, Hannah, Hannah in Hebrew, um, cannot bear children, and she wants a child. And she goes to, to, the, to the tabernacle in Shiloh with her husband. And it's very interesting that they're going on, on a, a feast. And we read in, in the book of Samuel, they come on the feast of the Lord from year to year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, this is very interesting. This is a very interesting combination of words that also appears in the story of the concubine in the book of Judges. If you recall, there's a terrible uh, war amongst the tribes of Israel yes. over a concubine. Uh, and we hear that the Israelite tribes, they, they ban the tribe of Benjamin. They don't want to, to marry their wives, their, their daughters, with the tribe of Benjamin. And after a certain time, they understand that that vow is, is a very, very bad vow because it... it takes the whole tribe of Benjamin and, and, and cancels it from the list of tribes, the sons of Jacob. And so they decide to find a way to go around that vow. And they recall that there is a feast of the Lord from year to year in Shiloh. Hmm. Okay. So again, this phrase, the feast of the Lord from year to year, appears uh, in the book of Judges. It appears in the beginning of the book of Samuel. And so what is this feast. Mm-hmm. So when we're looking at the book of Judges, we, see, we, you know, we might think that it's Tabernacles or Passover or Pentecost or maybe one of the other feasts that we hear in the Bible. But we see that, first of all, it's connected directly to Shiloh. And we hear that the girls of Israel dance in the vineyards. Mm. Now this is not something that we know of the other feasts. So what, what is this feast? When we go to the Jewish sources, we hear that the two most happiest days in the Jewish calendars, like the Jewish calendar, are the Day of Atonement, mm-hmm. Yom Kippur, and the fifteenth day of the Hebrew month of Av. Hmm. Oh, so there is a there is an interesting uh, celebration of some sort uh, mm-hmm. that happens in the middle of the summer, which happens to be the time of the harvest of the grapes. And what do we do? We see girls of Israel dancing in the vineyards. Hmm. And when mentioning it, the words in Hebrew, and this is very important to read the the Bible in Hebrew, 
the words yamim yamima from year to year or an ancient uh, feast mm -hmm. uh, is only mentioned specifically with the feast of the Lord. And it also appears in the book of Samuel when Elkanah, the father of Samuel, comes to Shiloh uh, to pray to God. So this is apparently a very important feast uh, in the times of the Bible. Well, this is fascinating to me because, uh, and again, I'll hold this uh, DVD uh, up. It's called The Forgotten Feast. And now you know why it's called The Forgotten Feast. Uh, if a, f a feast, uh, one of the feasts of the Lord was sort of pushed back un until now, hmm. these, we're living in the latter days. I've said it for a long time. When Israel came back into the land, you know, beginning back in uh, in 1897, the first Zionist Congress, and moving on forward to statehood and all of the his modern historical events in the life of Israel, uh, the old things that were hidden began to be revealed, and this is one of them, Correct. obviously. So we think about the seven feasts of Israel. Now we are, we're looking at an eighth feast, which I think, and, and it has to do with the fruit of the vine, Excellent. which is always associated with celebration, with rejoicing, uh, and that sort of thing. Yes. That's amazing. Yes, it is. And, and, you know, we've always read in the Bible for thousands of years that the girls of Shiloh dance in the vineyards on the 15th of Av. But when you live in Israel, when you live in Samaria, on the hills, the same hills that Jeremiah said that, that vines will yet be planted in the mountains of Samaria after the big destruction of, of Zion in the time mm. of the Babylonians. Today, when you live in Samaria and you mm. see the vineyards growing and you see that the harvest time is the 15th of Av, it's physically in front of you, you feel it. You feel the need to thank God for the vines for the, the grape juice. Uh, and for the nation of Israel. And, and for, the nations of, for the nation of Israel. You're well, you know, the seal of Israel ha has the picture of, of the grapevines on it. Right, yeah. right, yeah. right. And, and the, the, the sign, the, the grapes, is in a way what, res what, what symbolizes the land of Israel. When, when the spies come back right. to the Israelites to show them how much the land is good, they bring the you know the huge grapes, yes. the big grapes. That that is the sign of Israel, and and in a way, the the forgotten feast, the fifteenth of Av, the, the day of love, the day of unification, is also a big celebration of the land of Israel. It's wow. it's so to say, an Independence Day or maybe a Thanksgiving like you have in, in the United States. What a prophetic picture that is! And of course, we it's love incredible. to study Bible prophecy. Israel is Bible prophecy, by the way, every bit of it. Uh, I want to go to Genesis 49, and this is uh, Jacob uh, prophesying over his sons. And he talks about Judah, <clears throat> and Judah is the, re the royal tribe of Israel, out, out of which will come the Messiah. And in verse 10 here he says, "...the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come," and that's the place we're talking about. Unto him shall be the, the gathering of his people be. So here we have the Messiah given the name Shiloh or Shiloh. Uh, what do you think that means? From your perspective, what does that mean to you? Well, I think that in, in, the, in the short term, um, what this verse does, it refers to Samuel. It refers uh, to the, uh, the news, the good news of establishing kinghood in the land of Israel, the tribe of Israel. Uh, and later on we see that Hannah, when she comes with Samuel to the tabernacle and sings a song of glorification to God, we see at the end of that song a, a clear appearance of Messiah, a clear appearance of the Anointed One. And so Jacob prophesizes uh, that Samuel will be the prophet that uh, that brings the king to the, the people of Israel. The line of kings. The line of kings. King Saul and then later on King David. Um, and, but the question is, what does it mean for the long term, for the future? Yes. What does it mean to, to the, the vision of the end of times, to the coming of Messiah, to the land of Israel, to the whole world? And I believe that in a way Shiloh is the heart 
of Samaria, the heart of the Shomron. And we are about to celebrate 50 years for the unification of the state of Israel with its biblical heartland. Mm -hmm. I believe that the return to Shiloh of the Israeli people, the Jewish people, uh, is, is a big sign and, and goes along the lines of the coming of the Messiah now, to Shiloh. Inform me here, is, is Shiloh part of the contested territory today? Yes. Yes. It is. It is. So uh, it's part of the. It's a northern. It's a northern segment of the, what I call the backwards B, Jordan River, and so it's in the northern larger segment, which is Samaria, Shomron, and Judea is in the. So south. There, are, there are some people today who would, would veto the idea. Of veto may not be strong enough. Yes, sir. They would not. Yeah. Right. But which the is Bible. just like our Lord to do something like yeah, that. But the Bible says. Uh, Shiloh is going to be a sort of a messianic uh, connection. Yes, yes, and we're seeing we're seeing that uh, when we when we're in Shiloh, and you see, when you see the vineyards that Jeremiah is talking about mm -hmm. that are springing out from the land, uh, and and the great wine and Samaria has such amazing wine that's being produced. Uh, it's really a, a heavenly wine, <laughs> a blessed wine, a wine of the land of Israel and a wine, of, a redemptive wine, in a, in a, in a, in a way. Um, you, you see, you see Messiah. You you feel that Messiah is coming. Now, I'm reading a, a few cover notes here, uh, doing doing a little cheating, <clears throat> but <laughs> right here on the on the cover is an interesting uh, uh, note. It says. Uh, uh, tabernacle stood in this spot for nearly 400 years. That's a long time, and I don't think we think about that. The importance of that place. If the ta imagine, I mean, that's a, a lot longer than America has been a nation. That's a long time for a tabernacle to stay in one place. Right. So this is a very important place, right? A very, very important place. I think it's a, a prophetic place, a place where where heaven touches earth. And today, a place that that resembles that 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 signifies the the current redemption, the the, the final redemption of the Jewish people, and I believe of the world. Now, and, you again, know, Gary, if I if I may, the, okay, uh, sure, go ahead. The, uh, <clears throat> on the point of four hundred years, one of the things that is uh, very instructive to people who go to visit this area is to notice that the the city of of Shiloh the walled city that was there that was conquered by Joshua is like like finger shaped or or dare i say foot shaped stretching to the south and on the northern end is this flat area where the tabernacle sat for 400 hmm. years and when you see the general appearance of this area because this is an archaeological site there's no town there of uh, mo the modern town's up on the hill above, modern Shiloh, the modern Jewish settlement. So this, when you go and see this area, you can actually see what, this is my opinion, you can see what Jerusalem kind of looked like in terms of scale and appearance. Mm -hmm. If you strip away the entire modern city, even strip away the Turkish walled city, mm -hmm. and go back to the time of King David, back to the time of Solomon, the arrangement of elements, the way the, the way the Shiloh tabernacle was and the city following to the south is the same kind of pattern that ends up being adopted by David and Solomon in, in, in after this period at Jerusalem. So it's very instructive and it's, and it's, just, it's just wonderful to see it because it's clean, it's devoid of all the distractions of modern architecture. And, and by the way, while we're talking about the, the, the view of the place, uh, t tell us about the, the, there's a viewing area up on a hill that has one of the most ingenious uh, projection systems I've ever seen because you, you are seated uh, in a little theater w with a circular screen, semi-circular screen in front of you and you see a movie about uh, Hannah and about, uh, and about uh, Hannah's uh, prayer to God and the miraculous birth of Samuel. And, but you can look through the screen at a certain point and you're actually looking at the real place down below. Yes. That's phenomenal. Yes, it's a new technology uh, where, where glass, transparent gas, uh, is being uh, run through a glass and then it changes the transparency of the glass. So when the movie is projected on it, you can play with the uh, op op opacity, opacity of, yeah. uh, of the, the sure. glass and it, it really brings <clears throat> to life the story on the actual geographics. So you're watching 
the the story of Hannah yes. and Samuel. It's almost like a time machine. It is like it's a time really, machine. It's very, very, very well the, done. Suddenly, the scene fades, and you look, you're looking at the real place. It raises the hair on the back of your <laughs> neck. It's really exciting. Now, quickly, I, I want you believe uh, in scripture. That is the script, scriptural uh, connection between God and and today's Jew. Uh, in other words, things are are really happening. There's a really a transaction going on right now, yes. and and so when you tour Israel, you, it's from that perspective. Yes, definitely. You're, you're not talking about something uh, that's third person, but I, it's, I it, don't it, understand how you can. I mean, I mean, <laughs> you're, I mean, it's 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 so overwhelmingly amazing, man. And right by my house, just a half a year ago, there was an archaeological uh, discovery of in, in, in a very, very mysterious Israelite site. Mm. And I went uh, to dig there for a mm. week. And we, fa- we just, you know, on the first strike of, of, of uh, we saw, we, we got out, we unearthed a small idol uh, that, mm-hmm. that's from the Israelite period. I mean, Israel is just so, such an ancient place. And there's so many places to discover um, that, that we're, we're doing these new discoveries all the time, all the times, and you know, knowing history, knowing what happened in the past thousand years, and how a nation that was expelled from its homeland mm-hmm. has 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 returned back to the homeland, and it's not only that; it's being blessed immensely, immensely by by God. Uh, you know, Israel uh, has 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 become a regional superpower in the Middle East. Uh, we we have. Gas and oil, which is something that you know, if you told me 20 years ago, I would laugh. We don't it's have wonderful. anything in this it's land. Amazing. Suddenly, we we're blessed by God with natural resources. We are a, a high-tech nation with 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 computers and, and agriculture and technology. And it's it's when you're walking in the land and you don't see things through the scripture, you're just ungrateful. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to well see put. Shiloh, well or, put. Go, I'm sorry to interrupt. I you. just said well put. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. If you want to see Shiloh uh, through the eyes of Aaron Lipkin, we have uh, this DVD for you. It's called The Forgotten Feast. And it goes into this idea that there is a feast, and that feast was, was commemorated, was celebrated at the location of the tabernacle there. And, and this is really. It's kind of a detective story, but it's also a prophecy, an eighth feast of Israel. Who would have thought? That's amazing. Uh, The Forgotten Feast, uh, we have it in our online bookstore. Just go to Prophecy Watchers, click on the online bookstore, uh, and and go down to, and you'll find a whole collection of DVDs. The Forgotten Feast, uh, The Footsteps of God, and The Gate of Heaven. And you can buy these, by the way, as a package. All three DVDs. Uh, for fifty nine eighty five, and by the way, we'll include a uh, a free uh, commemoration of the tour that we took in March of twenty fifteen. <clears throat> Join us in Jerusalem, and Daniel, you were there. You remember it? We did a lot of walking. We did a lot of walking, <laughs> but it was wonderful. <clears throat> so uh, uh, this is called the Hidden Israel Package, and uh, believe me, Aaron goes to places that. Uh, are, are sort of little hidden gems that you really want to see. If you can't travel there, the, the second best thing to do is to watch on DVD because uh, the production of your DVDs is very interesting. You s- sort of walk the grounds with a friend and you have a conversation with him. In the process, we are the third party who walks along with you. It's, it's a great idea <clears throat> for a great series. There's also really good uh, aerial footage in, in pretty oh. much each one of them. There. They give you a really good perspective of these sites. And you have a drone. I have a <coughs> drone. I call her Penelope. <laughs> and I take her very, very personally. She's a, she's a great companion. And she, you know, I, I like to think when I, when I see these aerials in the video, um, when it goes up, it gives you such a, a feeling of a godly spirit that God is yeah. looking above us. And, and uh, there's God's providence over, <laughs> over us, over what we're doing. Daniel Wright, Aaron Lipkin, thanks guys for being here today. It's been a wonderful conversation. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, keep watching everybody. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. 